Hey, what's up? Welcome to the brand new year. We got cooking, and uh, we got a brand new, uh, brand new episode for you today with a uh, returning guest, a uh, very good friend of ours, C.B. Smith, and he's here to talk about the novel of one of the movies that we reviewed last year. So why don't you join us as we go book to the movie? <laughs> So yeah, we're here, we're here back with C.B. Smith, and we're talking about fucking Razorback, and uh, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I'm glad that you guys showed me this book that is so much better than Frankenstein Unbound, even though that's not exactly a hard thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I could imagine. However, I do wish it was as entertaining as Frankenstein Unbound. Yeah, me too. That's unfortunate. It's not as crazy. Was it more thrilling than than uh, than Frankenstein Unbound? Did it make more sense, rather? It definitely made more sense <laughs> because Frankenstein Unbound just doesn't. No. <laughs> Does it, it just freeforms the whole fucking book. Uh, I do not know how the movie goes, but I do hope it's a little bit more um, concise, a little bit more uh, cohesive. Maybe. Gotcha. I guess we'll find out. All righty. So, yeah, let's get into it. Uh, who, uh, Smith, who was this book written by, by the way? All right. So, Peter Brannon, um, I had a hard time figuring out exactly who this guy was. I think he was an American because there's a few parts here that takes place in America. And when I looked up his name, this is the strangest turn of careers I've seen. He's the creator of the Judge Judy show. What? <laughs> you gotta be fucking kidding me. Yeah, he wrote Razorback in 1981. And at some point in the 90s, he became the creator and producer of an entirely new genre of TV show. The, uh, the courtroom reality show. Judge Judy, uh, Christie's Court, I believe. And I think there was another one. Judge Mathis. <laughs> There's a whole section in the beginning of this film that takes place in a courthouse, and it has a lot to do with the allegations of Jake killing his grandson, but he keeps telling everybody that it's a giant razorback. So I mean, it's a it's a sham of a court, so... Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> it's a joke of a fucking trial. It consists of the dregs of the town. <laughs> and I just want to put this out here. Here, we talked about this at the end of the Unbound one, our first episode here. Like Smith had just said, he hasn't seen the movie. We haven't read the book, so we kind of went that extra, I guess, proverbial mile this time. So we both kind of have different... Uh, I guess let's use the word scripts to play off of here. Sure, because uh, we exclusively haven't read anything about the novel, and Smith has not seen the film version of Razorback. That includes your wonderful episode, unfortunately. I will definitely check it out afterwards. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, you had to skip it so we can uh, keep it keep it uh, fresh, keep it lively. Absolutely. <laughs> Keep it sacred. Mm -hmm. Keep it sacred. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a bunch of crazy things in the movie, and I'm sure there's a bunch of crazy things in the book that you're interested in. Sure. I, I would love to know how the book got from, like, whatever it is into this, like, meth-addled fucking dehydration dream that is the fucking movie. Like, it feels like something you see when you're dying. Smith, how does this book open? And then maybe we can kind of tell you where, where the movie opens in comparison. They put the pieces together. You already opened up about the courtroom drama, uh, is that how it actually, like, officially starts? No. <laughs> There's some shit before that. Yeah, that's technically not how it opens. Okay, good, because we're going to be jumping around a lot if that was the beginning. Right out of the gate, uh, we're introduced to, we don't know his name, but we're introduced to Jake, and he's, like, tending his farm or whatever. It's, like, nighttime, and uh, he's got his grandson. He puts him down uh, to go to bed, and a... Uh, Bullet train of a fucking wild boar comes barreling through his house uh, and whisking away and or eating uh, his grandson. And he vows the revenge on this uh, Razorback. Okay, so that happens kind of sort of in the book much, much later in a flashback scene. Um, it is actually Jake's son. Oh! And it's treated very much like kind of like a Moby Dick moment where like this um, boar, instead of taking like captain ahab's leg he's taking uh jake's uh kid right it's described as like the boar kind of sideswiped jake because he was out in the field in the middle of the night hearing the boar mm -hmm. and it bum rushed into the house 
ran upstairs, killed the kid, and then kind of disappeared. It goes upstairs? Wait, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, it goes upstairs in the film? It literally, it's, okay. <laughs> it's like Jumanji! It's a giant razorback boar. And I mean giant, not larger than average. I mean motherfucking giant boar. <laughs> it's the size of a boulder. It's the size of the fucking house. It plows through it like a fucking train. And it leaves a giant hole. It destroys his entire home. And then it burns down. And then it burns down. Yeah, it tunnels through his living room. <laughs> You're telling me this motherfucker goes upstairs? Goes upstairs. Artistic liberties for sure then. Uh, I just pictured the yak from Ren and Stimpy like taking his hooves off and tiptoeing up the fucking stairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The boar's big, but bear in mind, boars get freaking huge on their own. Oh, yeah. yeah. Connor will never hear the end of that. Didn't want to post that dead uh, boar on Instagram, right? The Hogzilla. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to post a dead picture of Hogzilla, and people were like, well, movie violence is fine, but real life <laughs> violence is not. I'm like, exactly. You guys show violence all the time. You showed that picture of that guy from Scanner's head blowing up. Come on. I was like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> and people don't understand the fact between reality and fiction, I think, is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got actually a story about this. I've never seen a boar in real life, but um, when I went to basic training, I had a guy from uh, Indiana, and his uncle owned a bison farm, and they're driving around in a Range Rover, and they're noticing that there's one bison acting weird. Now, bisons are freaking huge yeah. on their own, and so they drive off noticing that the bison's going into the tree line, only until like, it turned around and just started like squeeing at them. It was a giant freaking boar. <laughs> And as it squealed, its whole family came out of the tree line and started threatening the Range Rover. Whoa! But eventually, my buddy and his uncle, like, got out. But, like, yeah, I used to laugh um, at Rob Baratheon dying from that boar in Game of Thrones until I finally saw what a boar was. And I was like, oh, oh, no, that thing, yeah, yeah, that's scary. Yeah. And he was shit hammered, too. So imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure Adonis was killed by a boar, too, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Look, boars get huge, but huge in terms of, like, maybe as tall as your hip? No, no, no. They get bigger. They get bigger than that? Are you sure? There's a there's a video of one, like, in a dumpster, like, rummaging around in it, and it is massive. No, no. I mean, at, like, height-wise. There was a lot of information in the book that I unfortunately didn't, uh go over but i do i have seen like pictures and videos of boars they're not standing next to someone so it can't really like adjust for height but like they're really intimidating looking so i i pulled something else up the tall end is like almost four feet tall yeah so that's about above your hip but this the what the the fucking razorback in the movie it's back on all fours is like 10 feet high <laughs> yeah well right so so you get all this like boar background basically that's how the book kicks off actually the the story kicks off almost like a nature uh, documentary talking about the the dry season of australia oh yeah it was kind of it was very interesting about um how when the roots and the grass start drying up animals start fighting with the farmers foraging for food oh. um the kangaroos become a huge issue and they're a huge subplot surprisingly mm -hmm. in this book uh, they come in and steal, like, farmland, and they have to compete with boars. Boars, they uh, turn to eating mostly meat during the dry seasons. Pigs, I believe, are omnivores. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, we know that for a fact from uh, our episode from uh, last year, Evil Speak, oh, yes. trying to eat Clint <laughs> Howard in the pig pen. <laughs> well, those were demonic boars. Does that count? Maybe. Yeah, because pigs have been known to eat whatever falls in their fucking pen. If they, you know, if they can eat it, they will. Well, here's the thing, too. Uh, weird fact: deers in the winter, if there's a shortage of greenery and and or whatever, uh, they eat fucking birds to say to stay alive. Yeah, there's a phenomenon called this. I did this research for the Bambi video. Um, the, it's opportunistic omnivores, where right. an animal will, in desperate need of nutrients, will consume animals. Like, if they're traditionally herbivores. I like the layer there of that, like, you know, it's this drought that they're experiencing at the mo at that particular time in Australia. I kind of, I'm kind of into that, which, like, kind of drives this animal even crazier or have a bloodlust, rather. See, that's the thing is, like, normally in a monster story, you don't want to explain what it is because when you do explain it, 
it becomes less scary and more grounded. But I like how the book actually handles this, where, like, it explains everything about the Razorback. What it is, its ancestries, on why it's a lot bigger than other boars, why and how it's so hungry. Is it of unknown origin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can you kind of go into that, actually? Because the movie doesn't do any of that. No. You know nothing about this thing all the way up to the end. The movie has a, a throwaway line, which I chuckled at because it's also a title of the movie we watched, but someone's like, yeah, Jake's like, it's an aberration. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, yeah. TM. It's much like Jaws, like we're in the book, you get some POV from the actual shark, but you don't get any of that in the actual film. It's very human-driven, human character-driven with the beast kind of thrown in there, you know? I got my notes up here about the, the Razorback. Um, it was born in the middle of Queensland, uh, it is a mixture of different boars that were emigrated into uh, the country through different immigration. So you have like the local regular pigs that were domesticated um, that are originally from Australia. Then you have the, the Asian boars that came in during this uh, huge uh, kind of a gold rush that they had going on, hmm. I believe. And another uh, set from the north uh, came in. So it's like three different types of boars coming together, born from it. So it's like it's a reasonable size, this boar, but it's explained how it's like a lot bigger. Sure. And as the story goes along in the book, it, it's, it starts to get parasites on its body and inside like tapeworms and stuff to explain why it's more aggressive and more and hungrier than all the other animals. Oh. So while like a regular monster movie that has like a, a mysterious creature you don't want to explain to you because it gets rid of that that fear and mysteriousness, this one works because it's like as you're reading about how parasites are making it hungrier and more aggressive, it's like, oh, if you're out in the open with this thing, you're kind of fucked. You're, you're poop in a couple minutes, it seems. In the book, yeah, some people become poop. About to get eaten by that fucking godless vermin. We've been uh, going through a lot. Uh, the beginning of the book, like I said, goes through like this nature documentary. And then we see a lamb giving birth. And the Razorback... We love animals here, guys, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I would have to consider my line of work. I mean, I have my cat right here looking on at my computer wondering why the waveform is is on the screen <laughs> <laughs> as I'm recording. So this, this uh, sheep is giving birth to a baby, and while it's in the middle of giving birth, this razorback comes out of nowhere and grabs the lamb that's still, like, being birthed, grabs it by the leg and rips it out. Oh, my goodness. Jesus Christ. I mean, if you're going to open up your book, that's an opening for you. Yeah. Sure is. My goodness. I like the writing style because it's not graphic. It just lets you kind of sit with that image in your own head. Like, you're the one that's making the, the gross imagery, not the book. Yeah, the, the ultimate farm to table. Yeah, there it is. That is the second worst thing in this book, I think, in terms of, like, graphic imagery that, to me, feels a little bit excessive, a little too exploitive, and... It took some of the fun out for me. Oh, and it, so that means it happens to somebody that we like. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling what that might be if it lines up with the movie, but uh, I feel if, if that's the case, we have a little time to get there. Yeah, sure. I don't know how much you guys like Beth. I was going to yep. say, we might as well just talk about Beth now because she's already coming up. Oh, man, yeah. If I have to assume here... <laughs> Because that is probably the other fucked up scene. <laughs> oh, they don't, they keep it? Well, there, there's some stuff that happens to this poor woman. Let's see if she, it lines up why she goes there, and then we could talk about that. Okay. Sure. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so we talked about the, the uh, court scene and all that stuff, so I guess that's all intact. Well, n yes and no, kind of. So um, Colin loses his son, and he talks about how it was a bore, and the, the police kind of believe him, but his wife doesn't. Oh! And it eventually becomes that, like, the wife does not believe him at all, and just more and more distance and more anger and fighting and stuff. And Cullen basically is just, like, to save her own sanity, he confesses to, like, yes, I did it. I shot our boy in a drunken... Wow! 
That's even worse. Okay, so they don't do that in the movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, the whole town is like, you're fucking crazy. And he's like, no, I saw a boar. And that's it. Because it's his grandson, his daughter basically doesn't believe him. And then she basically is written out of the rest of the movie. Yeah. And he's played up as like a crazy kook. But the only people who like make fun of him for being like the quote unquote crazy old man are like the villains of the story. So it's like. That lines up. Yeah, it lines up. So I don't know if you guys have this backstory, but immediately after this lovely scene with a sheep and its baby, <laughs> we immediately uh, move to Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. And uh, apparently the um, dog food company Pet Pack, mm. there was an accident that caused the truck to lose some of its shipment. And so these two guys, Yapsley and see, I had a hard time with characters because there's like maybe a dozen of them. Oh, geez. One is named uh, Wagstiff and Wallace. And I thought they were the same character until they met each other and were like fighting with each other. And I was like, wait, hold on. Oh, crap. I have to go back now. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, wait, hold on. Oh, crap, I have to go back now. Hey, we shot with the same store. (laughs) (laughs) Hermano. Are they like the quote-unquote main villains? Wagstiff is, no, Wallace. See, this is what I mean. I got confused. Uh, Wallace is the manager of a subdivision of Pet Pack. Yabsley is just kind of an innocent bystander who uh, may or may not have been drunk and crashed his truck and destroyed all the dog food. Ah. They decided to take a shipment that was meant to go to Hong Kong. Instead, it takes it to America. And I didn't think much of it until like three quarters into the book when it becomes relevant again. Okay. So in the film, there there is like... A blink, in, you know, you know, if you're listening, if you're paying attention to something else, it, it'll go right past you where they talk about that shipment in the Hong Kong thing. Um, but again, it's never touched on again. The pet pack thing is such is so in the background of this film. They've almost excised it completely. Like it's there for sure. Like where these two dudes work that we'll talk about. And it's kind of one of the reasons why Beth goes there in the first place. So does that line up? That lines up. Yes. Beth goes to Australia because of the food company. Right. But the, the company becomes like this intertwined, uh, role with like a much bigger thing that deals with the mafia deals with corrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. We don't get any of that. <laughs> you got you got the New York mafia, you have uh corrupt police um investigators in Australia, you have uh diamond smugglers <laughs> for dog food? Uh you have diamond smugglers in Hong Kong. You, you, it's it's a whole what? wow. Big conspiracy. If anyone's interested in this book, I would say uh Pick up a copy now because we're going to go into some spoilers. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I hope they include, like, mafioso coming to Australia and getting gored by a fucking Razorback because that's ridiculous. I wish. That would have been sweet. What do you mean you got problems with a giant pig? (laughs) What do you mean? Who you calling pig? Do I oink? Do I amuse you? (laughs) Brajo, get over here, you. So, Beth Winters, uh, she comes in early on. Um, She is... She's the type of person who is very, very invested in whatever political thing that she's into at the time. Ah. But she's also that type of person that will do that and put herself like front and center into situations she she definitely should not have been. Okay. They reference a real life. I'm going through my notes right now. They they reference a real situation that went down in the 70s uh, on Native American land um a huge protest that went down yeah there was a siege um in 72 73 she took part in um as part of a sioux protest and this is a real thing that happened a real event Hmm. but like it makes it sound like beth like shoved herself into this very clearly like situation that like people are personally involved with and she's putting herself in the same position as those guys and it's like no beth if you want your support Mm, yeah yeah stand in line with the other like pickers to show your support do not try to be front and center with the camera talking about injustices that you are not part of yeah she wants that limelight talking about shit yeah exactly absolutely and her husband's name is carl in the movie oh should they change his name who's a total piece of shit oh, man i do not like him at all but uh no the main thing when you first meet this guy is 
It's going to be their one-year anniversary when she's in Australia, and that's a little bit of a some tension between them. But basically, he convinces her, yeah, you got to take this job and go there to you know find out what's going on with these kangaroos and this pet pack. More or less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for whatever reason, because she she's like, that day she had done like a story about like uh, this farmer who was raising cattle fucked up or something and like got up all in his face and shit. And that's exactly the character you just described. And she's like, and that's why the meat's, you know, your meat's bad or whatever. And she's, he's like, God damn woman, get the fuck off my farm or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, she just goes to Australia to literally stick her nose on a tip, right? I think. Somebody's like, yeah, some weird shit's going down with kangaroos or something. Uh, go there. So in the book, she actually becomes like, she does this so much for like, I want to say like the the book stand in for PETA, the the animal league. Sure. She becomes like the leader of basically like the like the face to talk to on camera. And our first introduction to her is like a news uh, conference she's in where she just goes on and on about the poor kangaroos, which. I, again, like these are these are causes that I can see someone um, in Australia being passionate about, but like the idea of like an American person going to another country and lecturing that country. <laughs> right. Yeah. She goes to like the scariest place in the scary country. Okay. In the movie, like it is a desolate fucking wasteland. And if you looked at like a map, there's a, maybe a thumbnail sized town in there with five buildings. And that's where she goes. It's only on the old maps. They're not, it's not even on new maps. Yeah. And everybody there is a fucking criminal just by looking at him. Like they look like the worst scum and villain in the, in the galaxy. And then, yeah, she just kind of gets, involved with these frightening fucking people in the middle of this terrifying town in the middle of nowhere and willfully puts herself in danger the whole time and loves it and yeah <laughs> you're talking about uh there's a town in the book called thunderbend <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah <laughs> isn't it called like fucking uh, guts or something? It, it's, <sighs> there's like an australian name but it means it's like an aboriginal name for like entrails or guts or some shit i forget uh, yeah that's that sounds right or that name of the hotel maybe or something to that yeah something like that i think it was the hotel Hotel. Beyond Thunderbend? Beyond <laughs> Thunderbend. <laughs> but to something you had said a, a minute or two ago, uh, CB, I had brought this up on our episode. It didn't bother me as much on a rewatch, but... Yeah, like, why are the why is this American woman sticking her neck out for kangaroos? Like, hey, it's a good cause, don't get me wrong, but you're right, like, that is a weird cause for an American reporter to be, like, so passionate about that she's going to crack this case. Not some Australian reporter who's lived there their whole life, who maybe has some insight already. It's just bullshit. Like, she just wants the scoop to get noticed. That's it. That's what it seems like, anyway. See, that that's the weird thing, is that there is, like... Like, I don't hate Beth Winters because, like, there is, like, a bit of character in there where, like, she realizes that, like, she's putting... So, like, you talk about, like, her husband pushed her into this. Um, in the book, Gene, the husband, um, is getting more and more distant from her wife, his wife because Beth is doing all these active, activist stuff. Mm. And he's not on board. He, he eats meat. He occasionally cheats on her because she's not around. I'm not... <laughs> I'm not saying she deserves it, but, like, the author does his best to, like, try and convey that, like, Beth is miserable because she realizes she's losing her husband. Ugh. I was just going to say, because of that, if, if you're saying he has a history of cheating, something that happens later in the film totally lines up then. Yeah. Oh, gee, that actually makes a lot more sense now. Oh, you're not around, so I need to have sex. That makes it better. It's an excuse. Doesn't matter if at work or maybe dead. Not around. It's still not around. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Oh, yeah. I know I know the scene you're talking about, and it's like, ugh. Oh, my God. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, Gene, um, he's not the worst, but he's not exactly a great guy um, in the beginning when you first see him. But um, Beth has like character, like a characterization outside of her activism, and she realizes that she is being like pushy and and putting herself in situations beyond like what she should probably be doing as an activist. Sure. And just like the security guard two days before retirement, something bad happens to her. Oh yeah. Something real bad. In the movie, she ends up sticking her nose where it doesn't belong right in the factory and gets noticed by Dicko and uh, what's the other guy? The Dicko brothers, whatever. Oh, she goes in the factory in this one. Okay. She breaks like through the fucking window and like films them like killing like the kangaroos and like putting them in the cannery and shit like that. R what? Yeah. What? Well, I think they're dead already. They are definitely chopping them up into smaller pieces, though. Same difference. They're they're fucking putting kangaroos in the dog food. <laughs> they are, and I kind of like I had no idea that like 
kangaroo meat would be in dog food. I, I can't imagine like hunting those things, but it's a thing. Uh, you know, now that you bring it up specifically, my girlfriend's parents' dog, it's on a special diet. It doesn't eat kangaroo meat, but another <laughs> dog they originally were looking at getting this about a year and a half ago. Uh, did eat exclusively kangaroo meat, so that it's a thing. That's fucking weird. Of all the things. I mean, I've had kangaroo jerky before, so I can't really say much. Oh, I've had a kangaroo burger before. Oh, that sounds delicious, actually. I'm good, but uh, enjoy. They're super lean, so they need to be mixed with, like, a pork, uh, dare I say, razorback. <laughs> Convenient. Yes. So here, here's the thing, like, she does that, and she gets footage of them, like, Dick, the Dicko brothers, like, doing that in the can and they obviously don't want anybody to know or whatever. And then that's her like moment where she's like, hmm, maybe I went a little too far. So in the book, she actually meets uh, Cullen, Jay Cullen. Oh yeah, she meets him at a bar. Uh, well, in this one, in the book, she meets him while he's buying bullets, which if you're an activist trying to make your hunter look bad, that is the best opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jake is apparently like a really really good shot he's been uh, killing kangaroo for like 30 years and the way that like I'm reading it in the book is like kind of like how um, us here in like New Jersey and other like forested areas that have like a really bad deer population sure um, you have deer season like you have kangaroo season um, Beth is trying to make everyone like this is what I mean like the book is great in that like it tries to showcase this this gray area of like uh, there's a practice that's mentioned in the book a lot called butt shot, which is you shooting a, de um, a deer, a kangaroo, um, like in the hindquarters, because if it bleeds out and dies, um, apparently the meat's not good or something like that. Gotcha. But like it's torture, it's torturing to the animals. It's like shooting a deer in the leg or something and just letting it waddle out right. all through the night. So Jay Cullen is basically the stand-in of like the ethical hunter, where he's like, no, 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 I just kill kangaroo. Huh. Like, I put them out, like, I shoot them, and I try to get, you know, one-shot kills as best I can, while the Dicko brothers are, like, the bad hunters, where they just do butt shots. That is so ridiculous, because Cullen tells her in the movie, like, he doesn't hunt kangaroos at all. He's exclusively hunting uh, razorbacks. Like, that's what he does. Oh, so he is Captain Ahab. There's no season for hunting Razorbacks. He gets, like, I guess, like, he gets made to look bad because I think she's talking to him and he basically says, like, yeah, fuck them all, destroy them all, kill them all, send them all to hell. Yeah. Um, and she's like, this guy hates animals. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because the Dicko brothers are the ones that are like, if you don't shoot him in the head, that's gonna suck. We gotta shoot him in the fucking head. Well, they say that. They don't ever successfully do it, but they definitely say it. Well, that's because, well... That's because Carl fucks their shit up. Right. But let's not jump too far ahead here. Yeah. So that was the thing that, that Beth did with Cullen. Um, and she's with her sister Jillian. I don't know if she's in the in the movie. No. Nope. <laughs> sister is excised from the film. <laughs> yeah. There's only there's only five uh there's like four main characters, really. That's it. See, that was the thing. Like, I, I'm not a big fan of thrillers, and this book is more of like a, a conspiracy thriller mm. because there's so many intertwining characters, so many little details and stuff, and I in like 300 some odd pages i have like 160 notes here trying to like whoa well i make a lot of notes anyway but like this was bad because i'm like try just trying to remember like names and and certain aspects and little details beth talks to colin they leave and jillian the sister is the camera operator and she's huh. mad that beth takes the spotlight for everything while jillian does a lot of the research and stuff <laughs> gotcha yeah they, she's replaced entirely with some other like australian dude that's there who stays at the bar and really doesn't do anything just gets shit hammered also jillian used to date bet's husband <laughs> oh the additional wrinkle huh this is so bizarre yeah I i'm just like wondering where i have like ideas of where this is going but i really have no idea this is like matt hooper fucking mrs brody dude it's what what are we talking about it's a whole whole other subplot yeah jillian gets like her own thing um as we go along in the story so i'm kind of sad to see her like completely annexed from the uh from the movie in the movie, Beth goes to the, the food factory and sees the Dicko brothers just shoving kangaroo into cannery. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> more or less. They're like chopping it up and throwing it into a fucking grinder or whatever. And then she's and then she's had basically. So she jumps in her car and drives away and thinks she's scot free. But yeah, but she's like a major asshole about it. She's like honking and saying, ha, ha, I got ya. <laughs> yeah, fuck you. She's like, nana, nana, boo, boo. And then they chase her down in a fucking Jeepers Creepers truck. Okay, so this is where it got like kind of weird and abstract in the book where like Beth talks to Jillian. 
about how like, hey, I have a lead on the this creepy town Thunderbend, but I'm going alone. I have no idea why until like you don't find out till much end till the end of the book on like w- who she was talking to about what. But um, she goes in and she disappears. And we don't really see her. And throughout the book, we get the occasional, like, seeing what the uh, the Razorback is doing. Because through all this story about pet pack, kangaroo meat, dog food, smuggling diamonds, there's a Razorback in here occasionally in a book called Razorback. <laughs> okay, I need a little bit more clarification on two things here. Sure. First of all, where does this manager character come into play in the pet pack? And I guess secondly... I don't know if you want to just go into this after the first part. Where, When does the diamond uh, uh, heist come into play? Because that's not in the movie at all. <laughs> so I guess I can spoil it because it's all the way at the, like, you get, like, bits of it throughout. We find out that the shipment that was meant to go to Hong Kong that actually went to America instead because Yabsley, the driver, uh, had his accident. Wallace messed up. That shipment was supposed to go to Hong Kong because a couple of those cans had diamonds inside the dog food smuggled from Thunderbend. Oh. And so uh, jewelers in Hong Kong would kind of like sift out the diamonds in the dog food, which when I found out in the book, I'm just like, just put diamonds in the can. You don't have to like put in with the dog food. Uh, Sure. Hey, this one's jingling. Like, there's a section where a character in the book is just like, hey, it's kind of funny if some owner just realizes their dog just shat out a diamond. I'm like, no, because that would cut up the poor dog. Like, oh, yeah. What are you talking about? That's probably fatal. Yeah. Not only that, I don't think they're going through their shit for the diamond. They're just going to throw it out. Exactly. Like, right. The the jewelers in Hong Kong would, would sift through for the diamonds and then send them over to New York where the mafia would somehow not explained in the book make it like a clean sale so that it can go into the regular diamond industry instead of being like a black market type thing sure i'm sorry this whole subplot is like putting a fucking hat on a hat <laughs> yeah it's a fucking killer board you don't need no, this shit like <laughs> not at all it's gone from the movie thank goodness yeah because it felt so bloated in the book there are many scenes where like i'm reading and i'm like okay i'm kind of invested with this diamond thing yeah yeah okay cool 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 Next up, Razorback. Nothing to do with the diamonds. Like, all right, all right, fine. And, <laughs> and then back in Australia. There's other scenes with, like, Cullen going through his vendetta against the boar, and there's a lot of real suspenseful scenes. And then all of a sudden, next chapter, no, we're back to the diamond plot. I'm like, I don't care about the diamonds. Oh, my God. <laughs> That that like that sounds like when you're playing Assassin's Creed and they pull you out to have you walk around a cabin, some fucking animus. They go, okay, go back in. I'm like, you interrupted everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually a pretty good example. I was gonna say, it makes me flash back to fucking reading uh, the Game of Thrones series and getting a Dorn chapter like shoved in there. It's like, oh Christ, back to Dorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So is this where we hit? I guess the first climax that makes you kind of scratch your head. Well, well, hold on. I, I was curious to see, like, where this manager for this uh, food packing plant comes into play because there's no manager in the movie. It's just, like, the two main goons. It's just Benny and Dicko. That's it. That's literally it. They're, they just take turns managing each other. Yeah, Wallace, he's the one that messed up because he, he didn't realize the diamonds were meant to go to Hong Kong. Right, okay, got you. I don't know if he always knew about, the, like, the fact that they were smuggling diamonds. I... But now he's caught up in it. He's one of the minor characters that I had to, like, do my best to keep notes on. And I got him confused with another character named Wagstaff. Yeah, got you now. (laughs) So I'm like, uh, so I'm trying to remember, like, crap, what did he do and what did Wagstaff do? Damn it. Must have not been important. Yeah, well, I guess I guess what I'm really trying to find out is also the same thing Joe's trying to find out is, does he get in the car? Does he run this woman off the road? Or is he just unrelated to that whole side plot? So we don't know exactly what happens uh, when Beth reaches Thunderbend. Um, I want to say it's a generally good mystery, except for like, so... During one of the Razorback chapters, we meet the true hero of the book in my in my eyes. There is a baby kangaroo that survives uh, from his mother, God. <laughs> ah, little Joey. I call them Rocco, but sure, we can call them little Joey. <laughs> that, that works, too. At wallab- wallabies and kangaroos are different, I think. Yeah, but that's fine. So this, this baby kangaroo uh, just came out of the pouch. Mom's still trying to feed him. This is very much of a Bambi moment. Because mom gets shot oh. by the Dicko brothers. It's a butt shot. So she's kind of like walling around, like trying her best, but she's limping and stuff. And then in comes Razorback and uh, just full on 
like eats her because she can't run away. So Razorback kills the mom and we just keep coming back to this baby kangaroo throughout the entire book to the point that he's like the last chapter and I'm just like, he survived. Yes. <laughs> Is this broom kid? Is this Razorback's broom kid? I don't know. He had the gift the whole time, man. But like he has the best journey, this, this baby kangaroo. I'm more emotionally invested in this one like animal than I have with like any of the characters in the book. Not that they're like, all like horrible people i mean they kind of are but like you you introduced a baby kangaroo i'm going to be invested in this thing yeah yeah if you if you do this something terrible i will put this book down <laughs> hey guess what smith what it's not in the movie <sighs> nope not at all at all now this is a weird thing because it sounds like this book could be three different fucking books it feels like three different books and sometimes the movie feels like two different movies yes <laughs> And we're and we're getting to we're getting to that crossroads at the moment. I was gonna say there's a stretch in the movie where you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> My question for you is: Is there a car chase between the Dickos and Beth, and what triggers it in the book? There is not a car chase with Beth and the Dicko brothers. There is a car chase, actually, very nicely well done. This is what I mean about like, oh, there's a nice scene, and then we go back to Razorback, and then there's a nice scene with Razorback, and then we go back to the Diamonds, and you just get like very frustrated is this a diamond car chase it's it's related to the diamonds <laughs> uh one of the characters is a whistleblower again i don't remember which one there's so many of them and him and his wife are, are driving off like hiding from anyone they, they're this is what i mean it's a conspiracy thriller so like they don't know who's in on this uh mafia diamond thing the razorback yeah the razorback's behind it all <laughs> I wish. Then, like, it, the, it would actually involve itself in the story. Turns out it's a guy just wearing a skin suit of a Razorback. <laughs> it confronts the main character and goes, like, give your mind to me, whatever the fuck that whale said in Orca. Blah, 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 blah. Merge with me. <laughs> Merge with me. Yeah. Fuse consciousness with me. The guilty needs to be punished. There's this really, like, suspenseful scene where the couple is driving in, like, in, like, a regular, like, city car. And they're driving in like off roads with mud and stuff, and they notice that they like been followed by this guy in a pickup truck. And they, there's a scene where like it's again really suspenseful, really good, where like the the truck is slowly gaining up on them on this road that it clearly has an advantage on because the car needs to drive slowly because it's almost like ice in this mud. And then the truck just ends up pushing it off over the cliff, killing the couple. Oh my god. <laughs> What? Oh my god, is that Mick from Wolf Creek? What's going on? Anyway, enough about that. Let's go back to Razorback. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. That's what happens in this book. Like, really crazy scene, and now you're invested in that storyline. Weird. And then we just go off to the other one. So in the Razorback storyline, kills the uh the the kangaroo mother, and then it, it smells blood. And we get a scene where we're not told who this person is, but it is a woman naked and tied up to a tree. And this is what I mean. Like, like this is the worst scene in the book because, again, it's not – like, you're not there when, the, when everything happens. It's not in gruesome detail, but it does tell us exactly what happened to her. Sure. And the Razorback – eats her while she's tied up there and like i said horrible things did happen to her and i'm not going to really get into details about it well she got it worse in the book apparently yeah she got it way worse in the book did it involve an axe handle what no, no. I... never mind then well you can't deprive of us uh, of, of that i think we can put the picture together <laughs> there joe well you gotta tell us like a little bit jeez so so this is what happens in the movie more or less smith she gets driven off the road by the dicko brothers She's all fucked up. They pull her out of the car, and then I, I think it's Benny. It basically goes to rape her, but then the Razorback comes in, scares them off, and then she's like, oh, thank God. Gets in her car, it comes in, it comes out, attacks her in the car, and kills her like the T-Rex. Oh, yeah, dude. Rips the fucking car apart, eats her inside the fucking car. Um, and then, and then it kind of goes to the next morning, and Jake Collins at the site of the accident, kind of looking it over, and he finds a bunch of axe marks in the ground, and that's how he realizes the Ditko brothers were involved. Because they always throw their knife down or some shit, or their axe or whatever. In the dirt. Oh, that aspect is in the book. Oh, it is. But we find out like much, much later. It's weird because in I guess in the movie they just show it explicitly, but in the in the book they're like, oh, something happened to her, and we're gonna just tell it from the boar's point of view. It's kind of an interesting 
way to write that actually it it would be interesting if it wasn't like literally the only time it uses this this aspect of like oh see i didn't realize it was beth until much later because sometimes i'm very dense <laughs> it's it's set up as the razorback is hunting and then it says this nameless woman is tied up sexual assault happens twice oh jesus christ she's bleeding out and the boar smells the blood and then it mentions how the boar eats her. And that's all we get. We just get a nameless woman. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, well, this is like messed up. Like you just randomly have a random woman. And then later on when everyone's like, where's Beth? Where's Beth? And then I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, where the other protagonists go? <laughs> yeah, because she's like the main person throughout the, in the in the movie. And then she just gets fucking eighty six by by the by the Razorback, and then we're and then we're stuck with Carl for the rest of the fucking movie. Oh God! Yeah, we she gets psychoed, and then yeah, uh, Carl comes to the movie, and I was like, "You're who I'm stuck with." Yeah, why do why don't we just get Jake the rest of the movie? We got this fucking wet noodle, <laughs> right? That's what I thought the movie was was that it was mostly Jake's story because I've seen like <laughs> I've seen like trailers and stuff, and like he's like prominent in a lot of it. Ten percent of the movie. Oh, ah, yeah. is it the best parts? Because yeah, oh yeah. Again, you have that Ahab kind of thing going on where he's, like, hunting this thing and or describing uh, it and dealing with, like, his anguish from from his, his grandson dying and things like that. I would argue it's probably the most consistent part of the movie, like, his story arc. There's not too much that really veers off path, whereas, like... Carl's story, I mean, I don't know where it goes in the book, <laughs> but his story just is, like peppered with bullshit just it's interesting stuff don't get me wrong like we talked about it in our, our episode some of the abstract art that's brought in that maybe we'll get into here mm -hmm. but it, it just kind of meanders like a motherfucker for the rest of the movie yeah like Car carl's story is totally all the place and character wise like a lot of weird shit happens to him it's not really connected i guess thematically anyway every time jake's on screen like it's totally the same throughout the entire thing and the emotional energy is through the fucking roof every single time it almost seems like they tried a little bit of that mystery thing that's from the book because like nobody knows where what happened to beth except benny and dicko jake has an inkling but really uh, carl goes there to the town to find out what happened to her in the movie that's like the second half of the movie like that's what that's about right you're on the you're on something there with uh benny and uh, the dicko brothers knowing what happened to beth but mostly because they're the ones that did it uh, in the book. They kind of do it in the movie, too, more or less. I mean, she's in the predicament she is because of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Gene, or, you know, we can call him... Um, Jarl. Carl, and uh, he, in the book, he's like some kind of stockbroker in New York who also hires Bet's brother, which makes the cheating a little bit like... Oh, my goodness. Wait, wait, they, he hires him to do what? I don't know. Stockbroker stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to care of my taxes or something. <laughs> Come sub at my job. <laughs> business people -ness. He's a business person with businesses. Mafias. You happen to know any Italians looking for some diamonds and some fucking dog food? <laughs> I might know a guy. Hey. Numbers. So our first introduction to uh, Gene or, or um, Carl is uh, when he's going through immigration into Australia. And it is the most ominous thing ever because it's like he's being weirdly cryptic about it. The the immigration guy is like asking like, uh, what are you here for? And he's like, to find someone. <laughs> <laughs> what is he, Liam Neeson? Okay, okay Batman. Immigration guy says, uh, all right, is it for pleasure? Is it for business? And he's like, depends if I find her. Okay. Again, he keeps this up and the immigration guy is just like, and if you don't find her and... <laughs> It's it, it just like, why aren't you arresting the dude? Like, he's clearly, that is not what you say to immigration. First of all, it sounds like he's swearing revenge against someone to someone else. Like, I'm definitely going to find this person. And I'm definitely going to hurt them. And if I don't find them, officer, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find another wife in about five minutes. <laughs> Or at least a temporary one. <laughs> that that happens close to. Um, he goes there and like he goes to find his wife, but like again, he just literally like just dicks around for a little while, and he's like, "Huh, I'm from Canada or something." And then he like partners up. He like goes and hangs out with Benny and Dicko because he thinks that they know something. And then we get all this weird psychosomatic shit. So I don't know about the psychosomatic shit, but uh, that does happen. He does dick around a little bit with the uh, in, uh, investigators, being like, "Why aren't you finding my wife?" And he's just and the investigator. Like, listen, we have a lot of missing people 
here. So there's that, and then he's just like, well, I'm going to find it myself. He goes to Thunder Bend, and he pretends to be from Canada. Mm -hmm. And he does meet up with the Dicko Brothers, because they're just like, hey, you want a job? We're going to go shoot some kangaroo. And Gene's just like, well, okay. Because <laughs> they he heard the Dicko Brothers complaining about Beth. Oh. Yeah, so there is like a, a connection there, where it's like, okay, you, you know something, or you hate my wife, and you don't know that I'm married to her. So yeah, I'm going to go to like hang out with you guys and investigate. They go to... Uh, the Wagner farm, uh, who, uh, this girl named Sarah and her sickly mother, they run this farm, but not well because it's a huge property and the mom's sick and Sarah's only 16. Those two hired the Dicko brothers and now, um, Gene to go shoot the kangaroo, but the Dickos, they're the ones who do the butt shots and everything. And there is a weird scene, I wouldn't call it psychosomatic, it's like Gene is having a kind of like a nervous breakdown or an emotional breakdown because he's never really shot a gun before. And here he is seeing a kangaroo get shot and left for dead, but like wailing, like crying. And it's, it's, it's getting him like to go crazy. So he takes an ax to go kill this poor kangaroo. Yeah. And then he just tells the Dicker brothers like, I can't do this. I, 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 I can't. So they're, so they just kind of leave him out there with a sleeping bag in the middle of the field. They do the same exact thing in the in the movie, yeah. Does he get attacked by the Razorback? Yes, and he does, but well, I guess the only thing I'll say about that whole scene, the the way it's set up is very different in the movie. Um, but but basically the same scene does play out that you just explained. The major difference is he keeps saying, oh, I'm a deer hunter. I hunted deer before. Yeah. I think he did mention that to the Dicko brothers, but in reality, in reality, he's like, you know, he's a, he's a big New York uh, business guy. Like, yeah. Doesn't leave the city. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they really rub it in his face when he can't kill this uh, kangaroo. Right. Uh, and they leave him there. And I don't think he he doesn't get attacked in the movie. He just fucking like freaks out at night because he, it's freezing and he's like dehydrated and doesn't have any food. Well, right. Uh, but eventually, after he go after he trips more or less, uh, he hears like something in the distance, and that is the Razorback kind of approaching on him. Yeah, he has a like a five minute hallucinatory fucking uh, journey across the desert. Like, <laughs> yeah, he like goes through the desert. There's like a fucking horse skeleton that comes out of the ground and all this crazy shit. Because I guess he's just like all fucked up. That sounds awesome. No, oh, it's aw it's great, man. It's like something out of a Richard Stanley film. Um, and then he comes upon uh, uh, this farm, and there's like a windmill thing, and then yeah, the Razorback comes, and he ends up like getting chased up this fucking uh, windmill like in a in a watering hole almost we we kind of during the episode we're debating whether this was jake's old farm or not but it's never really spelled out it's just kind of like hi huh, it could be but we don't know yeah because it like burns down in the beginning of the movie and he hangs around here a lot the razorback this is like his stomping grounds where he goes to this watering hole or whatever and there's a bunch of other fucking razorbacks there like smaller ones right so those are all part of the of the book um so we find out that the farm belongs to the wagners uh, Jake is hired by them occasionally because Jake is kind of like the loner because no one really wants him because he talks about the Razorback so much. <laughs> uh, the Dicko brothers are cheaper and they get they get more of a job done, so they get hired more often. Jake gets attacked by the Razorback in the middle of the night. Um, it's kind of it's it's a pretty tense moment because the Razorback like gets caught in Jake's sleeping bag and he manages to escape and he gets his leg like really gored. Like, really messed up. And then we get a Razorback chapter where it's described, and this is what I mean with, like, Moore's explained, so it sounds more terrifying. The Razorback kills the alpha, uh, the alpha of three different packs, so now it's leading, like, a super pack. Oh! Of boars, yeah, that just go around eating and killing, like, everything. That's crazy. I thought it was, like, a political gathering of, of boars. Super pack. <laughs> We're going to drink whiskey and wear clothes now. We gotta raise some money for the boar party. All you other animals have to stay in the bonds. Suddenly this became a really weird adaptation of Animal Farm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except Ryback's there. Um, it's explained that the watering hole is like the only one for miles around. Ah. There are moments where like some of the pigs, because the Razorback is full of parasites, it's big and hungry and aggressive and there's not a lot of food. So like this thing is killing and eating like 
uh, members of the pack, its own children that like, cause it's mating with the, the females cause it's the alpha. So like it, it's, it's a, it's a monster. And like I said, more is explained about it. So the more terrifying it is. I kind of love that. Yeah. That's, that's one of the great things about the book that I liked. Um, well, not to mention there's other males in the pack. So they're also super aggressive, super hungry. So Gene or, you know, Carl, <laughs> he, uh, he finds himself like near the watering hole and there's a couple of the the male uh boars not the big razorback that are trying to go after him and he manages to swim into the, like the middle of the watering hole and get onto this kind of raft that's in the middle mm. this is like a really intense moment and like me the reader and and gene are all like kind of very ecstatic being like oh they can't swim this is great mm -hmm. and then one of them starts swimming. Oh, they don't. They don't ever learn how to swim in the movie. They're just fucking landlocked. Nope, that's it. It's, it's really, it's really good writing. Like I have to give the, the the writer credit for this one because like that's a really tense moment because it's like you're relieved and all of a sudden it's like we're going back to Game of Thrones. That one bit where like the the White Walkers are waiting in front of that lake. Oh yeah, and they realize like oh the ice the ice is fine okay and then just you know. <laughs> so the boar starts to swim it's struggling and it's starting to squeal and you're wondering why until you realize like as it's trying to paddle with its like front hooves it's cutting its neck so it's like the more it's trying to struggle the more it's cutting itself and then eventually like kills itself what yeah this book sounds so fucking mean does it get caught in like barbed wire or something just with like its uh tusks no no it's it's um um hooves it's hooves as it's trying to kick up like it's trying to kick up on the surface like a doggy paddle oh oh my god yeah what the fuck that's weird yeah that's brutal <laughs> I'm like picturing that oh shit like connor says it is mean-spirited because it's trying to show like the this uh drought is causing all the animals to act a lot more aggressively a lot more hung like they're hungry right so they're going to take a lot more risks um and so this boar died trying to get to gene um eventually the Dicko brothers actually save gene um, by running up in their in their range rover and shooting at some of the hogs huh and he gets nursed by sarah the the young girl who owns the farm all right let me stop you real quick so sarah's <laughs> so, so, oh so boy. sarah's in the <laughs> film uh but she's uh -huh. she's with jake like not with him but like i believe she's like his other daughter well okay we were wrong about that when we reviewed it originally because when i rewatched it it's much like smith said where she's just another person that lives in the neighborhood okay so she's she's a neighbor right but she says in the movie that her parents both died at different times but sure the point is she's like 10 years older than in the book apparently and uh so you can probably guess where this is going with the movie you you mentioned the the razorback like fucking up jake's uh leg yeah yeah the dicko brothers do that too him because they find out that he was talking to Carl about Beth. <laughs> right. Mm. So they roll up on his ass at his campsite and they fucking literally bust his fucking knee into in the into smithereens and kill his dogs. Okay, that's a scene that happens later on, and but it's, it's not because he was talking to Beth. Oh, yeah. So that's going to be much later on. We'll put a pin on that. They break his punishment up. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, Gene wakes up um, in, 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 in the Wagner house. And Sarah comes in and we're introduced to her. Uh, her dad dies and uh, Jake becomes kind of like a surrogate father because he was friends with Sarah's dad. Okay, yeah. That lines up. It, it, it gets kind of weird. Like, I thought it was going to go this way that you say goes in the in the movie where, like, Sarah is described as, like, you know, acts a lot older than she is, a lot more independent. I'm like, no, please don't go here. Please don't go here. Oh. <laughs> it it does not, so I'm glad. Um, what Sarah is is, like, the only, like, good character, like, the only one that, like, there really is no huge faults. Um, but she does also act as, like, the surrogate mouthpiece for the author, talking about, like, ethical hunting treatments because she goes on to to gene about like listen butt shotting is bad but you have to kill these kangaroos because they're overpopulating and eating all the grass for our sheep and like good points and all but like it's it's like we're being lectured now and so we have like yet another we have our our corporate espionage diamond heist mafia story <laughs> <laughs> we have our creature feature with the boar uh, we have our, our murder mystery 
with Jean, and now we have like an environmentalist animal rights uh, pamphlet in the middle of our in the middle of our book. Now I gotta ask: Is Sarah also an expert at radar in the book? <laughs> mm. <laughs> is she a trained graboid hunter? Does she have a swanky computer that she puts a, a what is it a fucking a transparency over so she can triangulate positions? Does she have tracking GPS devices or and or GPS darts? Uh. I wish that'd be that'd be a lot more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it it actually it becomes a western now because now like there are scenes where like she's having like this this one against many battle on her farm against a bunch of boars and she talks about how like you have to shoot a specific way because uh boars apparently have like a very thick skin where like they normally are on top to mm-hmm. so you have to get them in the belly and that becomes important later on. Uh, in the book. It does? Yeah. Because it's not in the movie. But, uh, yeah, it, it becomes like a little, like, again, super interested now. Like, oh, shoot, now we're going to have, like, a big, like, battle, like, against all the boars on the farm. But, no, this doesn't really happen again. Um, Jean gets kind of healed by Sarah on in his leg. It, like, again, got messed up by the Razorback. And this is where it gets really dumb. So, Jean... Does not remember any of this except for like snippets. It's oh. it's described as like a fever dream where like he kind of remembers little bits and pieces. So this is what he does in this this fever dream. He steals Sarah's truck, <laughs> drives to the airport, buys a ticket, sits on a flight, goes to his old hotel, finds Jillian Betts sister sleeps with her and then wakes up realizing like they they fucked he goes all the way back to the u.s and fucks her sister no 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 they're all in australia oh Oh, okay like uh they're in queensland i think um closer to an outback area and then like they go to the city in sydney uh where the hotel is gotcha i'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's it's maybe a day or two full of just having a full on fever dream. One the no one in the airport is like, "Hey buddy, you okay? You obviously don't feel good." Uh, <sighs> no one on the airport, like no passenger next to him was like, "Hey, you're all right, man." The the no one in the hotel is like, "Mr. Taylor, we haven't seen you in like a week. Are you okay? You're bleeding from your leg." How about the woman whose sister is missing fucking her husband? What does she say? So there's actually, I give... <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? I like how everything has an extra layer of bullshit. Yeah. It's props to the book. There's like two or three chapters where like the, these two will bring up the fact that like, hey, we're looking for our missing sister and wife and we just had sex. This is kind of messed up. Like they actually like acknowledge it instead of like... Like in Orca, where it's just like the sex just kind of happened. Sure. And they actually like, they they sit there and like they go through everything. We like, you know, we dated before and I liked you and I was estranged from my wife and I believe we were going to get divorced and like like a whole bunch of stuff. Again, Uh, totally like I'm not in support of any of that, but the fact that the book tries to create a gray area and not just treat it like it's normal, I give it props for that for my pulp bore slash mafia book. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a little bit more sense for the book because in the movie, he falls in love with Sarah, like a Florence Nightingale type fucking thing. You also have to point out that he f- he starts to, like, it's very clear when he starts to develop feelings to this, mo- this woman before they've confirmed Beth's death. Yes. Like, they, they basically know, but they don't know no. Yeah, and, and they go on the adventure together, him and Sarah. Well, that's the thing, is that, like, Jillian and, and Jean, they, that's one of the things they talk about, where it's like, are we accepting that she's dead? We don't even know that yet. This is what I mean. Like, they actually dwell on it as, like, a consequence, where, like, it's it's character development that they actually did a thing and they're acknowledging that they did it. But then later on, they they botch it with, with Jillian much later on. We're going to find out why. <laughs> yes. Because in the movie, we go from, like, he's recovering and then Jake goes after the Razorback, if I remember correctly. Because mm-hmm. this is where he eventually, I, some other shit happens, but I know this is where he specifically finds, like, the remains of Beth in the shit. 
Oh, that's in the movie. Yeah, well, he finds a he finds a necklace because that's in the book. It was a ring. It was an anniversary ring. In the book, it was a wedding ring. It, right. It was a, a ring he gave her earlier in the film, I guess, just so that the audience br- would uh, piece it together. As if a wife wouldn't have a ring. Well, <laughs> well obviously, yeah. right. What other reason would there be? Here's another ring. They also do that whole thing where if Jake goes to go after the razor bag, and um, Sarah's like, "Here, take this fucking tracking dart." with you right so that way when you see it again you don't kill it you can fuck at least track it right and he he does find it and he uh i'm assuming this is in the book because you had texted us about a scene where a character says jesus wept oh yeah yeah yeah. now in the movie when he finally finds the razor back he doesn't take it out obviously in this scene but he does shoot it with the tracking device and it gets away but before he goes ham on it releases the the literal hounds on it he goes jesus wept and then he gets the gun ready yeah because this thing is immense yeah i think it's like the best shot in the movie you see of this thing and like its actual scale yeah and he he's even taken aback. he knows how big it is but he's like taken aback just seeing the enormity of this fucking thing again oh okay i messed up there actually is a windmill randomly in the book but it's just like a like a piece of just scenery in in the part we're talking about about jesus wept where he's looking on at binoculars. Yeah, he's he's there, and is it the same place where the watering hole is? It's generally the same area. Um, like it's it's on the Wagner farm. Yeah, in the in the movie, it's like right there. Like the that whole scene with Carl before is here, and it, this is again, this is kind of like where this is the place to find this fucking thing if if you want to look for it. Mm-hmm. Like in the book, it's described as like they're at that watering hole because it's the only one for miles. Sure. it does, They don't mention that in the movie, but it makes sense now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> also, it's like a it's like a shitting pit for the fucking the Razorback. Like just comes there, either finish meals, maybe bathe and just poop. Yeah, I think there's like dead bodies like in the fucking thing at one point. We see like skeletons in there. No, seriously. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Someone should tell the Razorback you don't shit what you eat, okay? <laughs> So if he, so, what is the context for him saying Jesus wept in the book? Is it is it the same? Is he in the middle of hunting this thing? Is there a different reason? He's in the middle of hunting both kangaroo and and the razor. No, no, he is doing the razorback hunt this time. He has about um, five hunting dogs with him and his trusty sheep dog named Spider. Yeah, Spider. Oh, poor Spider. R.I.P. Spider. Apparently, there's pig hunting dogs. I didn't get a picture of them. I didn't look it up. Um, but they're described as like these very thick skulled, not very cute looking dogs <laughs> that's what i remember their job in in the book and I'm, I'm i'm guessing for real hunters is like they latch on to the legs of the boars to get them wild up so that you can get a clear shot of the belly um in order to fire on them and like they're described as like very dedicated animals and will latch on to the boar's leg even after they're dead. So he does find the the razorback. He does say Jesus wept when he finally sees the size of the thing because <laughs> because it's been a few years since uh, it killed his son, so it got even bigger. Sure. And um it's it's a it's a big intense fight. Um the it, the Razorback obviously survives, but, like, got shot full of holes. And then we find later on that the wounds got, like, festered with maggots and stuff. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So it, it's even more aggressive now. And, again, it's like, oh, man, this thing is, like, like how can you kill it? Oh, so it's like a fucking zombie by the end. It's like, a, it's kind of like, um, wow, I'm going to name a, a, not obscure, but, a, like, in Princess Monooki, the big boar god. Yeah. It was really old but and festering wounds and stuff by the end, but it was still kind of lo- alive, and it's like... It's like it's it's gonna go down without a with a fight, and it's gonna mess up whoever it's fighting. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, most of the dogs got killed. Jake kind of he he's napping, and then in comes the Dicko brothers. Um, they got word from the mafia guys that they need a patsy. They need to frame someone for Beth's murder. So they think the guy that Beth videotaped with Jillian about the 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 butt shots in that gun store earlier in the book, he's the perfect candidate. So the Dicko brothers had a piece of Beth's underwear and they were going to plant it on on Jake. They knocked Jake out with the butt of an axe, broke his legs, 
poison the dogs. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's why I said we love animals here. And I'm reading this. I'm like, why are you guys making me read this? <laughs> I guess that's what happens in the uh, movie. They don't actually say they poison the dogs. It's just he wakes up in the morning, his legs are broken, and the dogs are dead. Except for Spider. I, I think I thought I shot them. Yeah, yeah, they they shoot them. Yep. <laughs> It's like, um, so they kill the dogs and then they like, they, they cut up the dogs in order for the blood to the, like, to get the scent of the Razorbacks. Oh, fuck. The movie's not that mean. No. But now we're in like our sixth novel in this novel where Jake is now a survivalist trying to figure out how, <laughs> so his legs are broken. He can't move. Spider's there is pretty like, he saves the day a couple of times barking at a boar. But before that, he's near a fire that he he had the the night before they didn't drag him away from it right they took his rifle but not his bullets so when a board started to like go towards him jake being a, a like an experienced hunter he's like trying to like scare it by screaming real loudly and when that didn't work he threw the bullets into the fire not expecting it to like like fire off and hit the boar, but at least make a very loud sound to scare him. Yeah, yeah, it worked, and it's like that's that's good thinking. Yeah, because huh, in the movie he's just like crawling across mud trying to get the fuck towards this like generator. Yeah, it's very condensed. There's another scene where like um, before Spider shows up, he takes one of the dead dogs and like throws it at a boar. Oh my god. He starts barking like a dog in order to get the boar to be scared, thinking that the dog is still alive. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. He's in the movie he's he sends off Spider to he's like, he's like go get Sierra. Go get her. And she runs off and then he makes his way to this shed. And the uh, the the titular Razorback comes back, scares all the other pigs away. That's like a thing in the movie, by the way. Yeah. So in the book, it we we keep cutting back to the Razorback chapters and the little baby kangaroo chapter too, where like he sees like <laughs> the baby kangaroo. Like like I said, he's my favorite character. <laughs> he he just kind of like he keeps trying to like survive this poor thing, and like he gets kicked out of all the kangaroo packs like that he finds them because they don't want him. Oh. What is he, Tony? Tony Chopper? Is this fucking Rudolph? <laughs> We could call it Rudolph. He's pretty much Rudolph, yeah. The Killer Monster movie stops so it can be fucking um, uh, the Ugly Duckling. Like, yeah, imagine cutting that to get like into Razorback, just like footage of kangaroo, like a kangaroo that lost its family. Yeah. <laughs> Sad tale. But but uh, Werner Herzog narrates all of his scenes. And this is the little Joey. And then the little thing found himself without his mother. He was a foundling or whatever. So the, the, the little Joey sees things going on and we see that like the Razorback back is like there's no more food anywhere so he's eating like all the all of his children and then sometimes the mom because like he's so hungry from the parasites and and the bullet holes making him just like agitated and eventually like some of the pigs like they just try to be like you know screw you i'm going somewhere else because you're obviously insane <laughs> You, we see the politics, the politics of pigs. You're in a bad mood, Razorback. Sorry, my tapeworm's acting up. <laughs> <laughs> I love how other Razorbacks like, this guy's too fucked up for us. Let's get out of here. So in the movie, Jake crawls to this fucking shed and the, this thing bursts into the shed and bites his fucking head off in the uncut version. <laughs> Oh, shit. Yeah, the, the regular version that I just paid for again on a rental for $2. <laughs> Same here. Don't see it. You just see the thing come in. He screams, and then it cuts like a shot of outside the shed, and the screen shakes, and that's all you get. In, in the book, Jake, he's with Spider, but we notice that Spider ate some of the poison, but not enough to kill him instantly, so... It's like that part in I Am Legend where, like, you just start crying and it's like he slowly goes. Oh, my God. Again, like, this book is so mean-spirited. And so... Wait, so he that's how he dies? He gets poisoned? He gets poisoned. Oh, that, well, that's nicer than the way... He, okay, we'll get there. I, I would say the movie is more indifferent and way more callous about it because it's happened so matter-of-factly and they don't even spend any time on it. I mean, we might as well just say it. I mean, he gets run over by a car by, by the Ditko brothers. They just run him over as he's going to get help. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, he sends Spider to go get help and, like, literally Spider rounds the corner and the Ditko's like, kill the dog. Yep. Oh, there's a dog. Let's hit him. And they fucking run right over him and that's the end of Spider. And, and one of the other ones is like, why did you do that? He's like, I don't know. Why not? Because I felt like it. 
<laughs> and then Sarah Sarah's dropping Carl slash Gene off at the bus stop because he's like, I'm going to go home. I can't do this. He's like, I know my wife's dead. I, I'm, I'm done. And then she comes fucking hauling ass back. I just saw Spider dead on the road. There must be something wrong with Jay Coppin. <laughs> and they bolt. They bolt towards the watering hole. So Gene uh, just basically was like, all right, forget about I'm, I'm not being part of this plot anymore. And then Sarah's just like, you're going to be part of this plot whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm dragging you back into the story. The movie ends twice and then it starts up again. So Jake, he takes, he notices that one of the dogs that were poisoned, uh, not Spider, was like chained up to a shed like 200 yards down and starts dragging himself up this rope uh, and locks himself in the shed and it's described as like steel like really really strong stuff Yep. and the Razorback eventually shows up and eats the dogs and then smells Jake on the rope and this is one of those scenes where it's again like super intense super like you're really invested because it's a very good well structured scene about man versus nature and, and can this thing really get through the steel shed and like hmm. th- there's a lot of paragraphs of just like very suspenseful stuff where like the razorback hits it trying to test it and you're like oh okay maybe it'll stand and then hits it again and like it shakes a lot more and then there's a dent from the tusk and then a rip then a tear and it just gets more and more and more and you're like oh my god i'm invested anyway back to the mafia story ah uh, real quick because i just remembered this scene in the movie and we we joked Again, on our episode, go back to the barbecue from last year, late August. It was actually our first episode that month. Mm. And uh, listen to that, please, uh, when you're done with this, if you haven't heard it already. But anyway, Australian Haggerty. There was these two scenes with this guy that looked like Dan Haggerty, where he's basically this is some guy, some some guy in front of his TV. He hears a ruckus outside. It's the Razorback, so he sets up a trap, and then later in the film, it comes back to the trap, basically gets set off and part of his home is ripped off by the Razorback and it's never seen again. Is that in the book anywhere? No, no. But it sounds a lot cooler than anything. Okay. I had to ask before I forgot again. So Gene has been buddy buddies with this uh, kind of a rookie cop um, named Briggs. So we get a whole backstory about that rookie cop and uh, like Briggs, the rookie cop, uh, like his dad was framed by the guy who becomes the head investigator. Uh, so he like vouts revenge. So he has his own superhero origin story about like infiltrating his department. And he has a different last name. So they don't really like put two and two together. Um, he teams up with Gene about during this like diamond heist. They go to like another random town where they get stalked. What? Yeah. So there's again a whole other storyline. Then they, uh, they, they find out some old phone numbers and he trace it to Hong Kong. So then Gene has like five chapters in Hong Kong where he meets uh Bet's sister Jillian, who's in, in Hong Kong for an entirely like unknown reason to us, the readers. And like, they have an argument about like, you know, you're trying to steal the story from me. That's, that's Jillian because she's really this, like her whole character now changes from being like kind of a sympathetic, like being stuck in her sister's shadow now she's like pushing on to get the story like any way that she can. Now she's jumping her grave to the point where like they break up, even though they weren't dating. And like, wow, it's it's really it's really weird. They really cut a lot out of the book. They did, and it's a good thing they did because this was just bloated. Um, and then they just they just go back to Australia. <laughs> they they find out that Hong Kong is who's dealing the diamonds from Thunderbend in the dog food to put it into the market in New York. It's all convoluted as all hell. Man, who could give a shit? <laughs> yeah. Who could fucking care? See? Like, this is what I mean. Yeah, like, the streams were being crossed at this point. Like, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and, like, it's just like your characters from movie, from story A, went to story B for a fucking day trip or something. And, like, they're like, oh, yeah, we have to go back to the other story. This guy's editor sucks. Now, I might be wrong on, on if it's the manager of Pet Pack or not, the uh, uh, Wallace. I, it might be a different one because, again, so many characters had a hard time keeping track, but there's a chapter in hawaii what with dennis nedry right he's got razorback embryos in a barbasol can cullen we got cullen here nobody cares <laughs> <laughs> see nobody cares but uh like they're trying to infiltrate the diamonds and get them out of the shipping crate to bring to hong kong so that like the the shipment can go to america as it was planned on accident in the beginning of the book 
they fail and there's this weird muscle bound silent uh guy who kills a security guard and then kills the manager off of a 20 story room in in a hotel just throws him off and just starts walking away and then we never really okay we never deal with that again like yeah it's just like another random segue to another story so that's like our seventh or eighth novel in our razorback novel <laughs> A little Hawaii uh, criminal thriller there. So there's that. And then they're back in Australia. Then they find the the shed, the aftermath after the Razorback. Uh, they don't mention like if they, they say Jake's dead, but like we don't see like any heads bitten off or anything like that. Just like a crushed shed. Um, but then they find out the Dicko brothers try to frame Jake. And so now, now we're on our 10th novel. Gene is now Mad Max going on Revenge. Against the Dicko brothers. <laughs> oh, yeah. In the movie, he, like, he the, he finds out that, like, he they fucked Jake up so that they must have something to do with, like, the disappearance of his wife. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. Like, he puts the pieces together. He sees the uh, cuts in the ground again. Oh, uh, yeah, the cuts in the ground. Yeah, Jake kind of tips him off and is like, oh, that's from the, the Dicko and Benny or whatever. And he goes looking for uh, Benny and Dicko. He goes to, like, their fucking hideout. <laughs> crashes a fucking truck into their front door. I would say, he, he doesn't just, he doesn't walk up. Yeah, he, he breaks down the fucking entrance with a truck. Dicko runs off and Benny, like, hides himself in a fucking mine or something. Okay. Like a little hole. Alright, so I know what you're talking about. So, uh, Thunderbend, it's described that, like, it's described as like there's holes everywhere. And it's like, miners trying to find diamonds and and opal i think it was opal yeah opal was what they were looking for yeah so it's like it's described as like you go down like 10 feet and then you do like a right angle going some in some direction following the vein and there's this uh throwaway line that the uh, rookie cop mentions about how like you would have candles lit in this hole to sense like the oxygen level because you don't realize when you're digging you lose oxygen, and if the candle goes out, that means you got to get out of that hole because you, you don't have any oxygen left. So, um, before we go further, let's talk about this rookie cop because his storyline ends before this whole scene with um, against the Dicko brothers. <laughs> like I said, it just segues back and forth, back and forth, and you get so confused. <laughs> Yabsley, the truck driver in the beginning, turns out to be like the mole who was telling. Beth about everything that was going on with Pet Pack and the Diamonds. So one of the managers of Pet Pack takes a gun and lures Yapsley to the cannery. And the 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 plan is to put Yapsley in the cannery and turn him into dog food. But what happens is Yapsley gets so scared he faints. So they can't like he's he's a big guy, so they can't pick him up very well. But then it's okay because somewhere off screen or off page. Uh, the rookie cop called all the cops to arrest everyone. And it just so happened the inspector was there too. And, oh, <laughs> they, that got resolved because the inspector now is going to jail. And there's a weird lecture about how the rookie cop is going to get his promotion. But cops don't like when you put away bad cops. <laughs> oh, my God. That storyline ends. And then all of a sudden we're off to Gene and his, his now Mad Max quest. <laughs> Oh, we're back to the to the second or the third climax of the story. <laughs> or fourth, I think, at this point. Is this the last act we got cooking here? No. No, we didn't kill the Razorback yet. What? <laughs> Are we going to fucking Hawaii? No, no, no. That was like 10 chapters ago. We're done with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he has Sarah's rifle because at some point she's like, take my rifle. I forgive you for stealing my truck. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he goes into the Dicko brothers where they're at. Um, I f forgot which farm they're on. I think it's Jake's farm. And he, like, scares them off by yelling, police. What? And they start making a mad, yeah, they make a, they, they don't stop being like, are there really cops around here? I don't know. So they make a mad dash. Uh, one of the Dicko brothers, uh, I don't think I read it right because it sounds like he hopped a fence and immediately next to the fence was one of these opal holes abandoned. And he breaks his legs. And Gene goes to him and gives him a lighter. And like that's like that's the connection with the candles where it's like, keep that candle lit. 
because when it goes out, it means you're out of air. And then he just leaves them there to die in the hole. Okay. He drops his ass in the fucking movie, dude. He fuck, he's, like, he's like, yeah, well, this is for my wife. And he lets the fucking thing go, and this dude drops down a cavern and fucking gets smushed at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Now, this runs together. So, like, the, the fate of Dicko and the climax of the Razorback kind of intertwine. Is that is that true for the book, too? Yes. So, Gene has the Dicko brother in sight with his rifle, and he... For one reason or another, he's trying to be like, because his back is towards him. He's like, should I really shoot this guy in the back of the head? The guy that killed and raped my wife with an axe handle. No, turn around so I can shoot him in his fucking stupid face looking at me. So, like, there's this really odd moment where it's like he's having this contemplation. Be like, is it wrong to shoot a guy in the back? Which is like, I'm pretty sure he deserves it. Just shoot him in the leg and then torture him to death. Or something like that, right? Shoot him in the ass. Yes. (laughs) And let him run around. That would have been fucking mwah, chef's kiss there. I mean, that's appropriate because the, the whole thing about this guy is that he does butt shots for kangaroos. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of kangaroos, in comes my favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the little Joey character? Rocco. Rocco just randomly waddles into the scene. <laughs> what? Unknowingly or knowingly, it's it's not very clear, luring the Razorback to this confrontation. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I brought my friend Heffa for for a party. I wish the movie did have this scene. Can you imagine like this standoff where where Gene or Carl is like trying to like think about shooting this guy, and then in comes a baby kangaroo, and you're like, what the fuck? And all of a sudden, with the razor back. Instead, we just we don't get any of this awesome like fucking side character of this this Joey. We get basically like, huh? We had this uh, little baby kangaroo in the book. What if instead? We had fucking Benny have the spotlight shine on him by Carl, and he's like, hey, I'm like the kangaroo. You're going to shoot me, right? Just fucking shoot me! And then the Razorback just shows up. Well, yeah, but that scene is so good in the movie. Like, oh sure, like sure. he shines the light on him, like the like the kangaroo or whatever, and he and he's like, just fucking shoot me, man! And he's just like holding that gun there, contemplating it, contemplating it, contemplating, making this guy sweat. Um, and then yeah, then we're listening the fucking we're listening to the whiz on headphones while we get chased by a giant boar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> forgot that was part of his character. Is that in the fucking book? Does he listen to Michael Jackson's the whiz the, the, the whiz? soundtrack no there's no uh there's no music uh mentions um but i did forgot to mention how gene found out where the dicko brothers were like uh what farm they were at uh he goes back to the bar where he was called you know when he said he was canadian and everything and there's just a random old drunk man just hanging out and gene leaves the bar and the old man just pops out between two buildings and is like hey i know where they're at and then just disappears out of the book and because i talk to you guys all the time now and we just got done with freaking frankenstein unbound i'm just reading this i'm like john hurt (laughs) (laughs) are you in this too yeah he had to help the plot along a little bit you know he had that script from baldwin you know baldwin handed to him said yeah they're really off track here we gotta we gotta point them in the right direction john we have to course correct these idiots (laughs) so there he was in between two buildings handing out the lore that carl slash g needed at that moment like he's more this old random guy is more integral to the plot than the razorback was for the majority which is just mind-boggling. Well, yeah, he, he's like, hello, I'm Deep Throat. Here's some information critical to the plot. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So going back to uh, little Rocco luring the Razorback into this confrontation, uh, first the Razorback hits Gene and, like, lifts him up in the air. Whoa! And just goes straight at the Dicko brother, piercing him, like, in the side and, and like, basically eating him while, like, impaling him it's it's kind of gruesome okay that's awesome we get this like weird like shining-esque like maze chase for, where i guess there's like a secondary kill pit this razorback has like right next to the pet pack or whatever it's like chasing <laughs> him around in and it kills him and it's like a maze almost but they go through like a fog cloud through like fucking silent hill or some shit to get there isn't it like dug into the ground too like it's it's yeah 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 dug into this it's like a, a trench that works like a maze it's very very strange. So it's kind of like a going going with our Greek myths before, like it's kind of like a minotaur with a maze a little bit. I'm kind of thinking actually of a of a Neil Gaiman book called uh, Neverwhere, where uh, there is a giant boar loose in the subways under London. Whoa! The whole book has a weird dream logic to it, so it, it's there but also not there. But it, it, that's the image I'm getting in my head right now. 
I mean, regardless, you know, it kills Benny, and then uh, Carl fucking hoofs it out of there in his truck, and then just, like, crashes, and then has to, like, go on foot, and this thing just immediately catches up to him in this warehouse. He fights the boar in a warehouse. In the pet pack. Yeah, they tease Sarah's death, too. Like, at some point, she wanders in, and then, like, you hear a scream in the distance, and then, like... For a convincing amount of time, she's not seen on screen at all. Well, right. In the middle of the chaos, as he's fighting it, she shows up in that. Yeah, you're right, Connor. Um, But does he have, like, a whole Terminator back and forth where, like, he gets, like, this thing, like, <laughs> it corners him in the pet pack in, in the movie, and then he kind of gets, like, a bar between them. It doesn't kill it, but he puts it, like, through the gut, and he thinks he takes it out for, like, a second. Oh, dude, it's so good. He puts it through his fucking mouth, doesn't he? Oh, yeah, maybe that's what it is. He does, yeah. He stabs it in its fucking mouth it sounds like a much more exciting bit and there's blood like pouring all over this guy so where does the book take you after the the final ditko brother is eliminated god i wish it was the cannery this sounds amazing i want to watch it now <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's still in the woods oh god gene happens to have the axe that the ditko brothers used wow they really went deep with this yeah the book needed to mention and gene needed to realize that this was the same axe that uh sexually assaulted his wife and he's just like well i can't think about that now i gotta kill this pig and i'm just like why did you mention it i'm not enjoying this anymore why that i mean i get what they're going for but that's too that might be too much it, it took me out of it same with same with the 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 assault on beth and how it was handled and and handled <laughs> oh you bastard oh i hate it i didn't axe you sean <laughs> so Gene's up in a tree, and the boar is like chasing after him um, up the tree, but can't reach him. And there's like a uh, a day and a night length time where it's just like wow, they're there. Well, nothing really happens. It just mentions like, and then the next night happened, and he's still there. Huh. Gene takes a large branch and basically makes like a giant spear. Then he throws the axe. And hits the boar in the head, and the boar's going erratic, going uh, up and down, up like trying to like like lean up against the tree trunk, and then running out and trying to like just in this pattern, like like a bad boss battle where he, like Gene's trying to time it right, mm. and he basically becomes our eleventh novel here. He becomes Tarzan and like lunges himself with the spear into the stomach of the boar. Oh my god. But he's above him in a tree. Yeah, yeah. It the, the trajectory is all off. It is incredibly off. Um <laughs> it's described it like he's timing it right when the boar's like trying to run up the trunk and its stomach is exposed. Oh, oh, okay, I gotcha. It's like the timing is incredible. Like the like it just becomes silly. So does this kill it? Uh yes, it does kill it. Uh Gene just kind of lays next to the boar as described in the book. Let's see if I could find it. Um, it basically describes like he's sitting next to the boar um, because he feels close to Beth because he knows the boar ate Beth. What, what the? F oh my god! Is this when it uh, in the book evacuates its bowels and that's where he finds the uh, ring? <laughs> <laughs> Right then and there. Oh, uh, no, I fucked your sister, but I still love you. Pretty much. That's pretty much it. And then the last chapter ends with good old Rocco. What what happens <laughs> with Rocco? Hold on a second. Before we get to Rock, before we get to Rocco. Oh, okay. This fucking this the way that he kills him is that he tricks it onto this like conveyor belt and drops this motherfucker in a giant fan a la Child's Play three. It's fucking metal as hell. Yeah, it's great. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you guys. Uh, one of the characters died that way in the cannery during the the police raid. <laughs> Oh, somebody fell right in there? Yeah, uh, one of the uh, the other manager, uh, I believe, uh, tripped over Yapsley's unconscious body and just fell in. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> this is this a Coen Brothers movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have, like, this whole, like, uh, this, this little thing where they have this boiler that when it starts to shake, you got to hit it with, like, a stick or else it'll blow up. And earlier in the film, when Carl goes there to do, like, his, you know, espionage and, and work a day, 
he witnesses this. So later on in the film, when like Joe had just explained that thing's going off, so the fan's spinning like way faster than it would normally, kills the Razorback. He's flying. You know, he grabs a fucking pig on a chain and is like flying through the air with this horrible blue screen effect. <laughs> and uh, because he knows that from like 40 minutes earlier in the movie, he runs over with this stick and hits this fucking boiler right before it explodes. Yeah. And uh, then, like Connor was saying, as he's leaving all sad. Oh, I couldn't. I couldn't save Sarah. She got killed by the Razorback. Oops. Uh, no, she's just in the rafters, hanging off some fucking chains. She got tangled in chains, and passed out, or something. Uh, she, the the Razorback wrapped her up in some chains for later, or something. It looks like she falls out of a spider web. She's like, and just rolls into his arms. Exactly. And then they kiss and embrace, and then credits. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> full, they go full out fucking monster movie, dude. So what? So what about Rocco now? Now that we got that hot mess out of the way, yes. <laughs> I can just read. It's it's uh, like less than a paragraph. It says an adolescent male kangaroo had stood back among the salt bush scrub through the previous night, following the instinct that guided him whenever the Razorback was near. All night and throughout the morning, the Razorback had ignored him, and so the instinct was reaffirmed. Now the pig was dead, and the young kangaroo was hungry. He bounded eastward toward the property fence where he could forage for the green shoots among clumps of dried-out acai grass. That makes it sound like the whole book was about this one fucking kangaroo. (laughs) (laughs) It's the lead. It makes it sound like you're at the end of this rewarding journey with this fucking animal, and that he has grown and become battle-hardened. It is Rocco's story. Wow. I I would like to think this is the same kangaroo that ends up uh, showing up in Link's Awakening, and you you ride on it. It's got fucking (laughs) boxing gloves and shit. This was its origin. Right here. It's it's possible, yeah. It's Kangaroo Jack. Uh, well, maybe. He finds fucking Terry O'Connell and, uh, or Jerry O'Connell and fucking, well, who's that other guy? Anthony Anderson. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, from Blackish. Um, so I, I don't know how we want to do this this time. I guess we'll just kind of go around, maybe start with you, Smith. Uh, if, if our, you know, what, what did you think about the book? And, uh, you know, do you want to watch the movie? And then I guess I'll kind of go around to the group and kind of ask the opposite. My favorite thing about the book is that when you're finished with that last page the last bit of anything about Rocco I turn the page and it's a whole giant advertisement for the movie and just makes me just really want to watch the movie <laughs> <laughs> now a motion picture it talks about the actors and what they've done uh, it says director Russell uh, Maliki was directing multiple movies in Hollywood including Highlander and Highlander 2 yes Lead actress Judy Morris, who played Beth Winters, wrote films including Happy Feet in 2006. <laughs> I forgot about that. There's a George Miller connection that we do talk about on the episode, yeah. A lot of Mad Max people worked on this movie. Yeah. Yep, sure did. Especially in the effects department. I believe it. The cinematographer for The Road Warrior shot this movie. That's why it looks so fucking good. There's um, there's a YouTuber um, named uh, Cecil. He does a channel called Good Bad Flicks. And right around the time that your episode came out... I love Good Bad Flicks. <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. Around the time that um your episode came out, he did a whole thing on Razorback. Oh, really? Yeah. I actually haven't watched that yet. Yeah, I didn't even know it existed. I watched it because it was uh, it's part of his exploring series where like he doesn't actually tell you what the movie's like, what happens in it, but he tells you like all the fun behind the scene things. And like it goes in detail about like the cinematographers were like they did music videos before and like you have like this like kind of rock and roll vibe to it a lot of duran duran shit i think i think so yeah it's been a while like i i've seen that video russell mccallhy i believe his name is but yeah that was a, that was a great video that helped me like understand a little bit more about what i was getting into in terms of like what i expected from the book and I, uh, I i i read a couple snippet of reviews before i got into it about how like the movie trims down all of this excess fat about the mafia and diamonds and everything. It just focuses mostly on Beth's disappearance and, um, and the Razorback. So it, it condensed everything down to a more coherent bit. And it sounds like from what you guys are telling me, like it's a much more, um, exciting experience. Oh, it's a trip, man. Definitely more abstract. I liked, how the book tried to add like this realism about this uh, the drought season causing animals to be like hyper aggressive about how this boar over like just happening to have ancestors from all the different types of pigs is like larger than other ones because of it 
how parasites make it hungrier and more aggressive. I, I liked that. I, it got me really excited. I just hated that when I got latched on to an aspect of the story, we are immediately put into a different part of the story that I did not care about. And then I get invested in that one only to go back to the other part. So I, I don't have a rating system, but judging from like, I think I would enjoy the movie a lot more, but if you're interested in like kind of a standard seventies thriller with a fun twist with Razorbacks in it, um, I think you would probably enjoy the book. This needs something. What is it missing? Yeah. <laughs> a killer boar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I really love the movie. Like it's it's such a good flick. And you know me, I gotta own this fucking book. Any regardless, I do want to check it out. It sounds like you enjoyed a majority of it. There just happens to be other stories that kind of get in the way of the flow. Um, but it sounds like it's really well written. I I think it's well written. Um, in certain parts, there's um the writing style does a thing I really don't like about. Um, sometimes where like we're in a point of view character but the narration is not a first person narration but the narrator is typing up in a way that the character that we're following would speak right like we gotcha. follow we follow the dicko brothers and he's a lot more uh violent and sexist towards towards female characters or we have jake's character and he's much more like calm and somber about things and and but then like Random points like the narrator would switch the the writing styles without actually um, changing characters. Like at one point, the Razorback destroys like a a uh, like a tub, like a a trough, like a feeding trough, and it's described as he tossed it like a fucking saucer. Wait, that happens in the movie. Yeah, at the at the watering hole scene, he grabs like what looks like a like an old trough for a um like a feeding thing. And that's how Jake sees it, like, because there's this, like, sea of pigs that are in the way, and then it, like, flings this fucking thing into the air, and that's when he sees it. Like a fucking saucer. Yeah. So it's it's written not awfully, but it's written competently, um, I think. That, that, what you just described, though, would annoy me, too. Like, the changing of perspective, I don't know. I, I get what you're saying, though, like, when you're reading a book, that, that can get tedious quickly. Like, the reason why I like King is that he pretty much writes the same throughout all of his novels but it's a third person narrative for most of it so like you're you know what you're getting into i'll say that uh I, i'm probably not gonna read the book it sounds interesting uh i still probably think this movie is like a three or four out of five i i don't love this movie i don't think it's bad by any stretch it's probably a shelf movie or or i forget what i said when we reviewed this originally it's, it's either shelf or top level dumpster but probably shelf um there's just like 20 minutes in the middle that really sag ass like really take me out of the movie where like barely anything is happening um and just like again the whole angle i said this when we when we went over this uh, originally for the show that just this whole love angle with sarah is just kind of like i don't need this shit uh and it sounds like the book you had it with uh beth sister even better yet i guess depending how you want to look at it oh my god i just forgot this whole, there's a whole other part. There's like five endings, and Jillian has an ending too. Oh my god. Oh god. What happens to her? Oh, is this Return of the King? And then they go to the Shire, and then they all leave. <laughs> and then Bilbo sails away. Beth went to Australia to to stop um, the importation of kangaroo meat into, into the States, and also to stop hunting kangaroo in general. And little did any of the characters know is that uh, <laughs> the, the House and Senate in the U.S. were about to stop importation of kangaroo meat anyway without them knowing it. <laughs> Making everyone's death completely meaningless. Ugh. And, and that just adds to her whole vain thing, her vain con uh, quest to, to gain notoriety via, you know, bleeding heart. And then Jillian becomes uh bad sister becomes like much more obsessed with getting the story out her way her name is the one that breaks the diamond heist breaks like the the story of all the kangaroo uh ties with the mafia and she calls a press conference over and it just so happens like her press conference gets interrupted over the police raid at the pet uh the petco uh pet pack company um and she gets like very like mad about it and she's just like well to continue this we should stop importation of kangaroo meat into the states and then one of the reporters are like uh jillian i don't think you realize like yeah like yesterday they stopped the importation and 
the, the way the book is framing the scene is like, yeah, she's getting her comeuppance back. And I'm like, what comeuppance? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder like how much editing was done to this book before it was finalized like did the publisher say like you need to add like this last chapter to make these people really look like a bunch of stooges the fucking epilogues of everybody the book came out in 81 and um a couple articles i've read about the publishing houses during that time like like this is the the very tail end of what kind of was like the the wild west of paperback publishing i don't know if razorback came out as a hardcover but if you could write like fast and and kind of like competently enough, you could pretty much get published by a major house. Oh, for sure. And, and it would be like fine. So like I don't think there was an a, an editor, or if there was, it was very lightly done. Sure. Um, because there's a lot of like a lot of fat that needs to be trimmed from this pork shop. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you put that. I guess my point is like. Like, as you're writing this book, why would you basically, like, get to the end and be like, ah, oh, everything that my characters just went through was pointless. Like, isn't that funny, audience? Like, ah, that's kind of dumb to me. <laughs> it's definitely, like, a, it's reminiscent to a lot of that 70s, 80s, like, like just visual hatred of, like, everything. Like, Orca had, like, that type of nihilism going for it. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like, full on with, like, the anti-Jaws rants that were going on in that book. Um I keep going back to King, but like Cujo is a very mean spirited book. Like everybody sucks in that book. This is why Rocco is my favorite character in this book. <laughs> the kangaroo. The kangaroo did no wrong. He lives a fulfilling life, foraging for food. He survived, and I want a sequel with just him. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Uh, Connor, and any final thoughts? Honestly, the book sounds kind of like a chore for me personally to want to read it. And it sounds like the movie Primeval, which is also a big killer monster movie. It's about the killer crocodile. Yes. And that movie gets really distracted with this, like, this regional warlord subplot because apparently someone said, you can't just make a movie about a crocodile on God mode. And I'm like, you can. And that's what I wanted. And then they made Rogue. And then it was like, oh, yeah, there you go. That's how you do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's uh, like that's one of the biggest knocks I have against that movie. I kind of like it for the crocodile thing. But um, this sounds tedious and like it would give me backlash. So <laughs> not backlash, whiplash. There we go. <laughs> so so there you go. That's all about that Razorback novel and a book to the movie TM. Uh, we're going to have some more episodes coming up with Smith. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, the Visitor which was the novel that was based on, or uh, that un of unknown origin was based on. So hopefully uh, we get to crack into that in a few months. That'd be nice. With a larger than regular rat. Not giant. It's an actual R-O-U-S. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even that big. Slightly bigger. It's a, In the movie, it's the size of a fucking Yorkie. I don't want to have this conversation again. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I know Tony's going to listen to this, so, you know, we got to... <laughs> <laughs> we gotta have his back on that one. To the grave, he'll take it. Um, where else can uh everybody find you, Smith? I uh I have my YouTube channel with just c .b .smith. Um, the show I do there is called Taking a Page. I'm currently working on a episode for Practical Magic from 1998. Um, ooh, based on the Alice Hoffman novel, the same name. Fun movie. Uh, interesting book. I have other uh, episodes going on that may interest. Um. Movie Dumps reviewers, I'm going to try and get my Resident Evil episode up and going. It was postponed last year because I had to go build field hospitals in North Jersey for the guard. Ironically, with a story about a viral outbreak, postponed because of a viral outbreak. <laughs> Can't make that one up. Nope. It does. Uh, I started getting an Instagram where I just fill it up with pictures of like my cats and occasional books. Um, C.B. Smith taking a page. Now, that's about it. I've I got to work on that social media stuff. You guys got it down, though. <laughs> uh, we, we got our quirks, but we're, we're, we're trying. We're trying. But, uh, I mean, I look forward to doing this again soon. Yeah, these are always interesting because it's, you, like, you'll break, like, on both occasions, you've brought a completely off-the-wall book from what I expected after seeing the movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, I, I wish it had more to do with that movie. I wish it, like, it... it was more like that because at least it was more like streamlined and easier and more coherent. Sure. Instead of just an overstuffed shit sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that concludes our book to the movie and uh, we will catch you later. Now why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? <laughs>